one of the things I discovered during my near death, after death experience is that everything really does matter. What we say matters, what we do matters, our human interactions matter. We all read the Bible <laughs> and we all believe that miracles happened. And there are so many accounts of miracles happening. There are so many accounts of people who died and who were brought back, not, not just Jesus, <laughs> but other people who died and were brought back miracle after miracle after miracle. But there's something about us that we are willing to accept all of that, but we're not willing to believe that God is still present and working in our lives and in the world today. It's a funny sort of a thing. You know, Mira, I absolutely not just believe, I know that miracles occur and God is present and working in every person's life, whether you want it to be or not. <laughs> And more importantly, whether you recognize God's presence or not, God is present and miracles do happen. And, and I don't believe everything's a miracle for sure, but many things are. But the thing that's interesting to me is even people who claim to be Christians, meaning we or Jew, you know, or Jews, people who claim to believe that the Bible is real and true you know we discount the fact that a miracle could happen today and it's the craziest thing but i know that if every single person took the time to to look backward at their life and actually write things down or even write things down prospectively and then look back on what they've written a year or two later they're gonna find tangible, clear evidence of God's presence. It's incredible. But for some reason, you know, it's more convenient for most of us to go, oh, wow, that's really weird. Huh? Wow. What a coincidence. Oh, huh? Odd. Instead of every time something like that happens, you go, hmm, could that be God? Could that be a miracle? I mean, it's really this difference in a frame of mind. And it's just like, you know, we have such short little memories, <laughs> you know, I mean, something incredible happens and we remember it for a couple of days. Some minor little irritation happens and we remember it for our lifetime. You know, I, I don't understand that part of human beings, but that's why I always encourage people to, you know, write things down, write things down. I mean, even in the Bible, you know, they put up Ebenezer's to remind themselves of the times that God was present. You know, God, I mean, God said, not I was, and I'm going to be. It's I am. It's present tense. Because I believe we are meant to live in the present tense. We are not meant to hang on to our past. We are not meant to long for the future. We are meant to live in the present tense because I think that's where joy exists. And I think that we are intended to live a joy-filled life. I think that's I think that's what God wants for us. But that's in the present moment. It's present tense. I keep even talking about heaven. Heaven's awesome. Heaven is beyond uh beyond our wildest imagination. It's it's our true home. It's everything that you imagine it should be and a thousand fold more than what you can imagine. But that said, that's for tomorrow. That's not the present tense. We are not meant to be here today longing for heaven, longing for tomorrow. I mean, that tomorrow will come. You know, that'll be waiting for us. 
we are meant to understand that heaven is waiting for us as a way to bring meaning and context and purpose to today. I mean, if there was no heaven, if there was no life after death, then nothing matters, really. I mean, why bother? But the fact is, one of the things I discovered during my near death after death experience is that everything really does matter. What we say matters, what we do matters, our human interactions matter, how we steward the universe and the, the earth we've been given matters. It all matters, but it matters because God is real and present. It matters because spiritual truth is true. <laughs> you know, whether you want it to be or not, I mean, truth doesn't change just because it's inconvenient. Oh, so, so true. And I, you know, I have so many questions that I want to ask, but we <laughs> must mention that you, your story and many other stories, there's thousands, like you said, that have had near death experiences and they've taken the documented scientifically proven witnesses stories, uh, New York times bestsellers like yours, and they've put them into a movie for us that yes. we can all go to called yeah. After Death. Let's watch the trailer of the movie After Death. Doctors resuscitate. I can't be dead because I've never felt more alive. I've never heard these experiences before. Hogwash. It was 1969, the beautiful day to fly. We were about 100 feet above the ground when I started noticing that something was wrong. It was engine failure. Trees were filling our windshield. I found myself above the crash site. And while I'm processing what I'm looking at, I can see a pilot and this is me. No two near-death experiences are the same. Out of nowhere, a trainer truck kept me head on. But they typically occur in a very consistent process. We began to go down the river, and my boat became pinned. I was drowning. The first thing that happens is called an out-of-body experience. And they come to a place of exquisite beauty. They very commonly see a light. Deceased relatives come to meet them. The first person I saw was my grandfather. Now I'm traveling like a rocket ship, straight upwards. And with that... <gasps> oh my God, I'm alive! But not every near-death experience is a good one. 23% had hellish experiences. I saw a black tunnel. I was just falling. I wasn't in fear, I was in terror. It was just darkness. Put me back. I don't belong here. I heard a voice before I woke up. You still have a purpose on Earth. I was very skeptical. I never felt alive and then dead. I felt alive and then more alive. I had full brain recordings from the dying human brain. Even though they were unconscious, they were able to give corroborative evidence. She's describing stuff that she just shouldn't know. This ain't right. You can't be mystified by that question. What happens after you die? This really does show that there is life after death. Well, after death uh, is a, I think, a powerful and impactful film. It's a documentary style, and it it presents you know, four or five or six or actually a number of other stories as well, but it presents people who have had near death or after death experiences and it mixes in some of the scientific research. And I think it's powerful because I think that getting to the point 
where you can accept that there really is life after death, that it's not just a hope or a wish or, okay, maybe I have faith. If you can get to the point where you actually say, yes, I have enough data. I have enough evidence. I know that there is a continuation of life. I know that there is life after death. I don't care if you call it heaven. I don't care anything about that. But if you get to the point where you can say, yes, life continues on, then what it does in my observation is it all of a sudden forces you to start asking the other questions, which is, okay, if there's life after death, then what does that mean for life before death? <laughs> and I think it, it forces you down this path of spiritual exploration and discovery. And I think that's really important. Uh, you mentioned my first book, but I actually wrote another book, Seven Lessons from Heaven, which was also on the New York Times list. And that's a book that sort of addresses this very point. Because the movie touches on the truth that there really is life after death. But, but the hope that's presented there, I'm hoping springs springboards people into the next question, which is, okay, so what? You know, so there's life after death. What does that do for me today? Because I think that that's of even greater importance. But I think this film is powerful because it reaches a broad segment of people. Ever, we're all going to die, of course. And most people are afraid of death. And so this movie addresses that. It addresses what happens after death. It presents tremendous assurance and reassurance and hope that there really is more. There really is God. And God is love. Every single person who has had a profound spiritual experience, I don't care what kind, comes away with the absolute knowledge that it is about love, that God is love. Everything stems from love. Um, everything, everything done, everything written, everything said uh, comes from a heart of love. So I think it's an awesome movie. I, I think everyone should see it. And more importantly, I think everyone who thinks they already know about death <laughs> needs to go to this film and bring a friend, bring a cynic, bring a skeptic, bring someone who says, eh, I don't know, because it's a really important question. How and what you think about death directly influences how and what you think about life. And I think it's really important for everyone. And I actually saw it last weekend. And I know it's so recently out in theaters. I would absolutely agree with you. Yeah. Every, everybody needs to go. It is also, it's exciting that it was done by Angel Studios. A lot of people know The Chosen. Mm -hmm. And a Angel Studios did The Chosen. And a lot of people know the movie Sound of Freedom. Mm -hmm. Angel Studios did Sound of Freedom. And now they've just come out with, with After Death. But I do believe exactly with along the lines of what you're saying is we need to, we are put on earth to wrestle with this question. And that is what happens after death. And the Bible tells us it's good news yes. that we get to walk around. God made us for a relationship with him and we get to be with him forever. But and I don't know if you want to tell it or you want me to tell it. We've got to talk about it. it it's a choice. And, and there is a choice, you know, right now in that, sure, maybe we come to the decision that there is life after death. But it was very profound. They said 23% of the people that come back from these near-death experiences have a very, very horrific bad experience. 
And there's a lot of parallels where a lot of things are the same. And I've read different books over the years on this, but a lot of the ones have, you know, people biting and scratching and right. uh, in, in the, in the bad place, uh, you know, where it's horrible and they end up crying out to God and they come back or obviously because they're able to tell us those stories. Right. But help us with, there is one critical absolute decision that needs to be made by every person in order to get into heaven. It's well, not, yeah, it's not earned like you were talking about. It's right. not, yes, no, we all they, want to decide to be r doing right every day, but help us with that, Mary. Well, I tend not to talk about the things I don't know about. <laughs> uh -huh. I talk about what I do know about. And my experience had nothing to do with, uh, with that. My experience had to do with love. The interesting thing for me is I've heard many uh, near-death experiences that would be described as uh, negative or hellish or uh, however you want to term it. And every single one of those people was pulled out of that experience by God's love. And so I tend to sort of put, put thoughts of that into like this box of the abstract. But what I do know is that we always have a choice every moment of every day to choose to walk toward God or choose to walk away. And that is our choice. God has laid this beautiful plan for us, but that's not, you know, it's not predestiny. We are not predestined. At every moment, we have a choice which way we can turn. You know, I love going down the river. Uh, and so I always like river analogies. And I don't know if you've ever gone down a, you know, a section of white water or, you know, moving water. In any given rapid or section of white water, there is an ideal line. And if you take your boat and you can work hard to stay on that line, you get to the bottom of the rapid and it felt easy. It's fun. It's exhilarating and energizing. And it's awesome. If you choose to go your own line, you may still get down the rapid, but it's not necessarily going to be a fun or exhilarating experience. And that is a, always a matter of choice. And God's love is readily available for each one of us, but we have to choose to accept it. I believe God is present and working and active in every person's life, even if they don't want that to be true. But in terms of accepting God's love for us, God's knowledge of us, God's plan for our life, that is something that we have to choose. We have to choose love. I mean, we have to choose to follow. And that's what I was talking about, is there's really one main decision. Yes. And that is to, to accept God's love for us. Yeah. To Absolutely. accept God's love for us. And, you know, the fact is Jesus came to show us what that looks like, how to do that, you know, what that means, how it transforms your life. And, and, that, and that's what happened to me is when I was 10, and my parents were divorced, so it was, you know, a lot of yelling and screaming, really miserable, even though they remarried to other people. But mm -hmm. I read my storybook Bible as age 10, understood that I was a sinner. Speaking of this, because I, you know, I'm about this one decision. There is one main decision that we need to make. But yes, there's always going to be lots of little decisions each day that we're choosing love. But I understood from reading that storybook Bible cover to cover that 
Jesus, uh, that I was a sinner, but I understood that Jesus was the savior and that he would forgive me of my sins. And it was not, no thing I could do to earn my way to heaven or yeah. earn his love, so to speak. But I could repent of the things I'd done wrong. He would graciously forgive me. And then I could accept him. The main decision was to accept his love, accept him as savior. That's why he died. That's why he came and died the most worst horrible death on the earth yeah. was for us, was for us. And it says, like you talked about the joy, it says in the Bible that Christ died for the joy set before him on the cross. And that joy that he died for is you, whoever's listening. Right. Yeah. That's how much he loves you. Yeah. And that's the choice. Do we accept God's free gift of his love because he wants us in heaven forever? So Mary, I remember that you talked about that you were a skeptic and you are not anymore a spiritual skeptic. And so what would you say, and I know the movie After Death really focuses on a skeptical, very skeptical, very scientific man who comes to the conclusion there is life after death. And what would you say to someone who's a skeptic? <laughs> I would say great <laughs> because <laughs> I, I am still a skeptic. I mean, I don't take people at face value. I don't uh, take what they've said at face value, especially now there are too many people who have hidden agendas. I, and maybe I shouldn't be quite so uh, cynical, but I am, I always have been. <laughs> so no, I think skepticism is actually a really good thing. We are given brains, we are given the ability to think analytically and critically. And I think we're expected to use our brain and to use our ability to think analytically. But that's different from saying, well, I'm skeptical of everything, so I'm not going to believe anything. Appropriate skepticism means you're going to question it and do some investigating. And that's really what I hope people do. The problem I see is that people are either, you know, spiritually arrogant, or I should say intellectually arrogant or spiritually lazy. Because either uh, people say, oh, yeah, you know, I already have faith, I believe that stuff. But my experience is such that uh, most people who say that don't. <laughs> most people who say I have a, you know, a strong faith, if they have a strong faith until it's tested, until they lose someone they love, until they suffer a setback. And then of course their faith is shaken or they lose their faith. I mean, we've all heard that story plenty of times. Or people are intellectually arrogant, which is really beyond skepticism. Intellectual arrogance really says, well, I've looked at it and I've made my decision and I'm not willing to look at any other information. But really skepticism is good because what skepticism does is it says, okay, do I think that there really is life after death? Do I really think that there's evidence for God's presence in the world and more importantly, in my life? Do I really think that miracles do or don't occur? And I mean, that's part of why I wrote my second book, Seven Lessons, is because I am skeptical and I want people not to just take me at face value. I, I want people to see the film after death, but I have to tell you, I don't want people to leave that theater having concluded that, yes, there's life after death. Personally, for me, I want people to leave the theater asking the question and being motivated to look for the answer. Because I know for a fact, because I've been challenging people for years now, 
And I've now had plenty of follow up of people who tried. I challenge people to prove me wrong, prove anything I've said wrong, prove wrong what people have said about near death experiences, after death experiences. Go to this movie and try to prove the filmmaker wrong because I know that no one can. I know that by undertaking an intellectually honest examination of the issues, any person who puts out that time and effort will indeed find enough evidence to allow them to make the conclusion for themselves. And we each need different levels of evidence, but they'll, they'll be able to make that decision for themselves that yes, there really is life after death. And yes, I may be surprised by it, but the fact is, yes, there really is a God that is real and present and working in my life and in the world. That's a pretty big deal. So no, I think, I think skepticism is actually a good thing because hopefully it's a motivator. It's, it's something that can inspire you to actually look at your own information, not just accept what someone has written, what someone on TV has said, what someone in the movies have said, because everyone has their own agenda. I mean, I, I really believe that people have to make this choice for themselves and they can make the choice by collecting their own information. Yes. And, you know, I fortunately accepted Christ through reading the storybook Bible, getting the own information. Great, a great source, of course. We right. have just, of course, been riveted by your story. We're so glad that after 30 minutes, God brought you back to us, even though I know you would have preferred to stay with him. Right. <laughs> Sounds like True. a good place to be. But yes. thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being willing to tell your story and tell it in such a way that it really uh, helps people to feel good about their questions and their skepticism and make the decision to know and accept God's love. We, we really thank you for being here, Mary. And well, bless thank you for you. this opportunity. It really is such a tremendous privilege to be able to share my experience with people. So thank you. And, and we need to tell everybody to go to After Death. How yes. do they find out and go to the movie, Mary? Uh, you can find a theater near you and you can buy tickets or claim free tickets by going to Angel Studios slash After Death. And Angel and Studios is really an awesome organization. They have done something with a couple of their movies and they're doing it with After Death where you can actually buy a ticket for someone else. It's wonderful. I mean, I love that you can, you know, if you're in a position to do so, you can buy a ticket or buy, you know, 10 tickets that allows people to see the film who wouldn't otherwise be able to. And I sort of feel like, you know, if there's a free ticket, a lot of people who wouldn't necessarily go see a movie might be willing to actually go out and step into the theater and take a chance. So I think it's a pretty, a pretty neat program. Thank you so much for being here in your time, Mary. We appreciate oh, it. thank you. God bless you. God is love and love comes from God. In 1 John, the Bible tells us that God is not only all loving, but that He actually is love itself. The heart of the Parent Compass television show is to bring the transforming love of God to families everywhere. In every Parent Compass episode, true stories reveal family struggles and how their lives were radically changed by the love of God. Parent Compass, an award-winning television series, is completely funded by people like you. If you have been touched by God and you wanna share God's love to others, would you please pass it on? Jesus tells us to go into all the world and to tell about Him. With your donation, you allow us to take this television show into many different nations and in many different languages, free of charge and a portion of your donation goes to Parent Compass Outreach to feed starving children. Your gift does so much. To make your tax-deductible gift, go to parentcompass.tv forward slash 
donate. That's parentcompass.tv forward slash donate. And thank you for sending love and hope around the world.